Music brings us together, even when we're apart. That's why we support Canadian musicians, festivals, and award shows. It's just one of the ways TD's Ready Commitment helps build a more inclusive tomorrow. Welcome everyone to our third Canadian jazz interview as part of TD Halifax Jazz Festival's virtual and vibrant 2020, our online programming. I'm very happy uh, to have a conversation here with trumpeter Lena Alamano. She's a Canadian trumpeter, improviser, and prolific composer with an active international career performing and recording cut cutting edge contemporary music, prim primarily in experimental, conceptual, improvised, and jazz settings, but also working in a wide array of other genres. She splits her time between Toronto and Berlin and runs her own internationally acclaimed record label, Lumo Records. Alamano composes for her forward thinking acoustic quartet, the Lena Alamano Four, as well as Berlin based power trio Orenschmaus. Also leads the electric improvising quartet, Titanium Riot, and trumpet live processing duo Bloop, and is a longtime member of Rob Clutton's Clutter Tones. So, without further ado, everyone give a big virtual round of applause. You, you might be able to hear it way <laughs> off in the distance here. Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah. So thanks so much uh, for, for joining me here for uh, a nice socially distanced chat. Yeah, uh, thank just, you for asking. My pleasure. Just wanted to start off with, uh, just wanted to know how things are, how you're handling the pandemic uh, and what sort of things have, have changed for you when the pandemic hit. <laughs> oh, geez. Oh, dear. How do we, uh, where do we start? Um, <laughs> yeah, uh, uh, <laughs> I'm flustered already. <laughs> um, well, uh, yeah, when the, when the uh, pandemic was officially declared, I had just arrived in Berlin, like days earlier, uh, and everything was fine when I arrived. So I it just, I got there and I was going to be there for my usual three month period. And I had a lot of gigs set up and tours and everything. And then, you know, the uh, bleep hit the fan mm -hmm. <laughs> and, uh, and, uh, and then I had to, I had to, you know, try to get back as soon as I could. So within that week, that was March, uh, by the time I got back to Toronto, it was March 18th. So, and I spent several days at the airport in Berlin trying to get a flight and, you know, everything oh, wow. like I'd buy a flight and then it'd get canceled. And then it was like total chaos, uh, very stressful. And uh, anyway, uh, I, I did make it back um, and then yeah everything was cancelled the whole you know rest of the year was essentially cancelled just within days you know all gigs and and tours and, and everything so um, that's how it started for me yeah <laughs> <laughs> and, then, and then I was in quarantine for two weeks in my oh, apartment right, in right. Toronto so I didn't leave for two weeks I was, yeah, it was it's all very uh, yeah insane mm -hmm. I guess. so so you're currently in Toronto right now I'm still here. Yeah, yeah. I haven't, yeah. Been, haven't been able to leave. Yeah. And what's the what's the vibe amongst uh, amongst your peers and sort of the musicians there? In Berlin or in Toronto? In Toronto. Uh, I guess in Toronto. Yeah. I mean, you know, I think everyone's trying to to just hang in there and uh, finding ways to, you know, be optimistic and and still create some kind of. Uh, yeah, I, I don't know. I mean, I. I I can't speak for everyone. Everyone has a guess a different situation and some people have families and some don't and mm -hmm. um, others. I just, some work opportunities come up here and there. And so you just take what you can get and just, I'm just, I mean, I'm still just trying to re reimagine the whole, how the whole thing's going to work for me because uh, everything was basically turned upside down. So yeah, now absolutely. I'm getting a lot of gig offers. Like there's still, you know, of course there's still no live music going to be happening in Toronto for well forever it seems like <laughs> yeah. there's no there's no talk of it starting again um, but uh, I I'm getting a lot of gig offers in Europe right now for the fall for oh, September wow. October and November and all you know Poland Denmark Germany and so I'm just kind of like oh but I'm not supposed to leave because Canada says I can't leave yet it's not safe and you know I'm just kind of perplexed now what what do i do because there's no work here in toronto there's going to yeah. be no concerts um but there's work over there but i can't go there <laughs> yeah and that can be tough <laughs> and that's something i want to talk about uh, a little bit further on uh, just about your sort of international career and how that developed um but at this time you know it's uh nostalgia is a big thing uh, when <laughs> things in the future aren't looking so bright uh so i would like to go and uh, sort of look into the past and sort of uh, just get an idea 
of uh, some of your earlier musical experiences and so how you sort of developed into the musician you are now. Um, so if you could just sort of give us a, an overview of your early earliest uh, musical beginnings. Uh, earliest? You want to go back to age four? Yeah, oh, yeah. we're, we're going back. <laughs> no. <laughs> um, well, maybe I'll skip, skip that part. Uh, I'm, um, uh, well, I started playing trumpet when I was 10, so maybe that's, that's you know, early yeah. enough to start there. Um, and uh, yeah, things kind of just rolled along. Um, I was taking classical trumpet lessons uh, as a kid, and um, were you doing your, this uh, was in in Edmonton. I, I'm I grew up in Edmonton. So. Oh, okay. Were you doing like a like a like school band program? I didn't actually do that. No, um, I did a lot of the um, what is it called now? It's like um, like provincial bands and stuff like like um, all city band and that kind yeah. of thing. So I, I didn't go to band program because I was already I started so early that I school band was yeah I didn't really like I was kind of a, a bit more advanced than that at you know by the time I was 12 I was doing a lot more stuff than you know and kids hadn't even started playing yet yeah, yeah so yeah I just I just so I didn't bother doing doing band in school but I had lots of other things I did um yeah and, uh, how did how did you come up on the trumpet um well my brother my older brother was already playing the trumpet and um my dad collects brass instruments uh he's also a brass player but uh he just also likes brass instruments so he has a collection of unusual <laughs> brass <laughs> instruments but one of the more uh usual type ones i guess uh, normal uh ones was a trumpet so and so i just my brother and i shared this trumpet for a while and then at a certain point i got i got a cornet i think that was my first actual horn that was mine was this uh nice cornet that i had short model um, that was maybe when I was 12, I got the cornet. Yeah. What was the weirdest uh, instrument that was around the house? Oh, <laughs> 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 yeah, you, you got to ask my dad about that. Um, I mean, we had, he had everything. He had a uh, like slide trumpet, pocket trumpet, a flugabone. That's kind of his main horn. Oh, have wow. you ever heard of a flugabone? I have. Yeah. <laughs> it's fun to say. <laughs> yeah. Um, I, don't, I don't know. It goes on. Uh, like strange kind of E flat horns like they're little kind of marching horns with bell front and they sound kind of like you know yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh mellophone with like that really big mellow you know what a mellophone is like it's got yep. a really oh, yeah. like the very round thing and the yeah oh that, does that have a bell front oh yeah it has a bell front too that's right so it's not like a french horn but it's like the bell comes out and it's really massive mm. <laughs> and very heavy <laughs> Well, it sounds it sounds like you had a very uh, brassy brassy home uh, <laughs> yes. growing up. Um, so you're mentioning that you uh, studied classical music, and uh, and and in your bio, that's also mentioned as well. So was that something that you were uh, like pursuing, like I guess maybe not a professional capacity, but like focusing on in your studies? Um, it was to a point, um, just kind of early on, and my teacher was was uh, uh, in the symphony in Edmonton. So, I mean. It, you know, at that age, the young age, I was just, yeah, it was, uh, I wouldn't say that I was, you know, ever got to some kind of professional level classically, but I did a lot of, you know, classical stuff. Um, but then I think, yeah, when I was a teenager, I got more interested in jazz and really went that direction pretty, pretty quickly. I mean, I, I, mean, I remember lifting, you know, Miles Davis solos when I was 15 and whatever. So I think by that point I was already steeped in jazz. So I, I still, yeah, I still work on classical stuff, but of course I'm, you know, I'm not, not at a professional level by any means. Yeah. Well, I feel like <laughs> as a, as a brass players, you know, they, there's always those uh, uh, certain reps and like Arben's books that provide that sort of yeah. foundation for brass playing. That's that crosses all yeah that. yeah exactly there's universal stuff for sure and i still do that and i and occasionally i still do some classical gigs but isn't yeah i'm not at a you know i can play third trumpet in a orchestral type setting but i'm still kind of you know the other guys will be kind of <laughs> covering for me yeah. <laughs> when it comes to the uh, you know double tonguing and you know quadruple whatever and uh, you know anyway yeah you know, you know the vibe yeah oh yeah <laughs> Uh, so you mentioned that you you grew up in Edmonton, but uh, made a move to Toronto in 1993. Um, and so, what uh, what spurred that sort of movement to to move out to Toronto, as many musicians do? Actually, it's, uh, well, since you you mentioned Merley before, it was actually kind of well, 
it wasn't Merle's fault, but uh, he encouraged me um, because he was at a clinic at, I went to Grant McEwen, um, which was a college at the time, that's now a university, but, uh, and when I was there, um, Merle came and did a clinic and I was talking about, you know, what should I do next? And should I go to Montreal or Toronto or whatever? And, and he said, oh yeah, you should come to Toronto. It's, you know, it's a big, big city, big scene. And uh, so, and then U of T, you know, was a good program so I I got a, a scholarship to go to U of T and I thought okay well sounds like a good idea Great. so that's how I, yeah yeah that's how that worked out yeah and so what uh, what were some of the experiences that you had uh, when you arrived in Toronto and uh, sort of gotten into the scene yeah I mean uh, so 90s <laughs> was a different time <laughs> for sure um, I mean I started working right away because there were just a lot of gigs um, I mean, life is so different now. I can't imagine what it's like now for young people, you know, mm -hmm. I can't even imagine. But anyway, so yeah, in the, in the early nineties and yeah, for sure. I was, I was, I had opportunity to sub for, you know, for my teacher, a bunch, Kevin Turcotte and like that, he gave me a lot of opportunities that way. And I, I le kind of learned by doing, you know, just on the job, I just would learn. And, and I did all sorts of gigs. Like, you know, there was, loads of jobbing gigs and mariachi gigs and you know whatever whatever kind of gigs you know anything um so i i was i was really busy doing school and gigging all the time and then doing sessions and stuff so it was really a great it was really a great time i have yeah, to say not not sleeping <laughs> yeah i mean you don't need to sleep when you're that age i guess yeah, exactly. <laughs> you know and it, it seems like that's a common thing uh, with uh sort of younger musicians who are starting out just to accepting uh all sorts of different gigs and uh just getting getting that experience and uh, so it sounds like that was something you're doing as well um and mm -hmm. since since now it, it is it fair to say that you're primarily involved with uh, more experimental and contemporary musics um, yeah so yeah i mean well sorry go ahead go ahead oh i'm just curious to know how that sort of, that that side of your uh career sort of started coming to fruition Mm hmm. Um, I mean, it was sort of gradual organic process, I think, uh, various factors like the whole industry and everything changed, you know, quite dramatically. But also, I also at some point realized I wanted to focus on my own work. Uh, as much as I love doing all this other work, and I'm really happy when it, when it comes up. I yeah, I realized that I need to really, at some point, I can't, I can't remember when exactly that was maybe 10 years ago or something I decided, yeah, I really want to work on my projects and my music and uh and that and that then just my trajectory with the type of music i was doing just kind of organically developed um into more experimental mm -hmm. way uh I, I it's hard for me to know exactly how that happened it just sort of happened <laughs> <laughs> yeah exactly. I, yeah and with that um uh, when like was you're saying it happened organically but i'm, I'm curious to know um, was there like certain groups that you were sort of starting to play with that sort of spurred that or were you, uh, did you actively sort of just put your own group together and go from there? Um, hmm. I mean, I, I definitely was, me I met some key people at, uh, at certain points that, and I became quite interested in the way they were thinking about music. And I, one of those people was Rob Clutton, the bassist. Mm -hmm. um, uh, so in Toronto, there, I sort of got involved more with, so as well as doing the, you know, more straight ahead stuff and whatever kind of other, you know, gigs. Um, then I was also I started doing kind of free stuff and experimental things. And I, um, yeah, I, I think there was, I mean, I, I was just kind of doing both things and they were, it was just two worlds kind of, so they weren't working together. They're almost, yeah, I guess it was, it was quite separate. Like it was, it was an interesting period where I was, I would be doing like, you know, playing at the Rex with, you know, a big band or whatever. Mm -hmm. And then I would be doing some really experimental kind of improvised stuff, you know, just sort of sound based and whatever. And, and those two scenes just don't interact or didn't. I mean, I don't know what was happening now exactly, but so I kind of felt like I had these two, two worlds going on at that point and then I just kind of gradually started I, I think it's because also gigs kind of dropped off and then the experimental stuff just I was just quite interested in going that direction and then yeah my uh, I wanted to have my own bands and so I 
yeah i mean also with bands it's kind of like everything else in life there is some kind of organicness to it because you can even if you decide like oh i want to have this band and i want it to be this certain thing i for me at least i never can that never really works out that way like i it just like i try something i think oh this is cool i'll try this and i had this idea but then it in, in inevitably develops on its own and has its own life and the dynamics of the people and the music and it turns into just whatever it is mm -hmm. um I don't know. I'm not being very clear. <laughs> no, no, and often, I feel like oftentimes in um, in experimental and improvised music, which I do, there's quite a scene here in Halifax as well. I, yeah. and, and groups that I like to play with often just come out of having a situation where we're all playing together. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, some, yeah, or yeah, just something maybe happen. You like, oh, I or you meet somebody new and you play with them, and something is it's just like, wow, this works. Okay, so I got to work with that person, and then, yeah. Uh, I mean, I guess, yeah, one thing leads to another usually. <laughs> yeah. Um, and so on the note, uh, I just want to talk about your, your group, the Lena Alamano Four, uh, and if you could just talk about how that, if that, what kind of organic formation that, that was uh, all about and uh, who, who right. was involved with that. Right. So um, <clears throat> let's see, we, now what year are we in 2020? We started in 2005 with the current lineup with Brody West, Andrew Downing, and Nick Fraser, mm -hmm. um, and somehow man we managed to keep that going over all these years. So that's pretty, that's pretty nice. Um, that was also, I, I think we, I think in two thousand and five, we had only been together for like a few gigs. I just wanted to try this, like a, try that or, uh, instrumentation, and um, and I, and I liked playing with everyone. I'd been playing with Andrew for so many years, and. Uh, the other guys in different situations. Um, and then Brody announced he was moving to Amsterdam shortly after that. And I was like, oh man, because this was really feeling really good. Like as we only did a few gigs, but I was like, man, this is going to be great. And then he said, oh, he's going to move there for at least a year or maybe more. He didn't know. And I was like, oh boy. So then we rushed into the studio because I thought, okay, at least we have some repertoire already. And I like the way this is going. So we just went in, maybe we weren't ready, but we went in and we recorded uh, our first album, Pink Eye. Um, and, <laughs> and then, uh, yeah, and then I think, I can't remember, Brody ended up coming back sooner than he thought. And then, yeah, we just were able to continue from there. And then every record's kind of been different and uh, it's just been developing. Um, I, I'm just so thankful that I have, have had that opportunity to yeah grow and, with the same people yeah and how how would you say like is there any clear like line through of that development of the group uh, after being together for so long um what are sort of wh what are ways that uh, the group has grown or changed with record to record well i, I um <clears throat> uh well these are difficult questions <laughs> <laughs> i mean um, it, it's fine if it didn't change <laughs> no no i i think it's clear that it did change um uh, I mean, you know, my writing has changed too, and just our, our whole concept kind of has been evolving. And uh, I mean, at uh, first, the first couple records, I can't remember exactly. Nick seems to know more of the details about these things. I can't remember the details. He seems to think there's like one, one piece that's a really, it was a pivotal piece where I, I, well, okay, I used to write, you know, more in more traditional way with the chord symbols and, you know, everything was more organized and the forms were more organized and clear. And then there was this one piece, which I can't remember which one it is, but he mentioned this a while ago, where we were trying to play and I just, I just couldn't, I don't know, it just wasn't working for me. And I realized, oh, let's get rid of the chord symbols. Mm -hmm. Let's just use the, because the material is quite dense already. The, the writing was quite clear and, 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 and it's dense in its own way, but also it had an openness. If you get rid of the chord changes, then it suddenly had, like everything just opened up like this kind of universe and you still had the the essence of the the piece was still there because of the there's three you know three contrapuntal lines that were there so it really implied a lot but yet getting rid of the chord symbols for me just like whoosh, opened up everything and then the, also we got rid of the form so we play the material which was a whole piece in itself and then well, then we just improvised with the material and develop developed from there and i think that's when we started moving in that direction. And then I stopped writing chord symbols altogether. And I, and I just stopped thinking in terms of 
heart like in terms of very specific harmony like it's more abstract now in my mind I, I don't really I don't label the harmony right I could analyze it and write it down but just something about the fact that putting the you know c7 with you know sharp this and flat that and whatever like it just seemed like oh, it's too specific and it's too restrictive um, and instead if we just learn how it sounds when we're playing the material then we can do what we do with it mm -hmm. which is I, I it's hard for me to describe what we do with it now because uh we play more kind of thematically with the material um, right and that that's something i do find like uh, having listened to uh, a bunch of the the quartet's album is that i find the the melodic strength is always i feel like it's always there uh even when it isn't right i guess i guess i said because i i do write quite melodically i mean it's all everything's relative of course because some people wouldn't call it <laughs> melodic but to, to me it's 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 melodic so yeah i think there it, it is this this balance of uh of melodic material with a freedom that like a harmonic freedom and a form freedom with the form and so somehow this the written material the melodic material is kind of holding it together mm -hmm. and we yeah we all we're always referring to the material in some way. I would say we never just play, we never just play the material and then, oh, now we're just playing free and whatever. You know, it's all, everything is relating to each other and what everyone's doing and also the material so that it becomes this uh, piece. That's, yes. that's got some coherence. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and with, with your uh, composition uh, approach, um, do you ever work in ways of like uh, more graphics, uh, sort of like graphic scores or more visual uh, concepts or is it primarily like like style, traditional uh, notations yeah i i mean i i always wanted to do that um but i i never i never did go in that direction I, i'm not saying that i won't i, I might i'm I, i'm actually quite interested in trying that but um yeah no still more the way i'm thinking with composition also with my trio in berlin it's the same thing where we i, I write the very specific material but with no chord symbols necessarily uh and then uh we go from there and we and we add you know textures and all sorts of other conceptual things to it but i don't i don't write that conceptual stuff we just talk about it and we work on it musically but we yeah there's no graphic and there might be instructions actually i sometimes have instructions with words yeah <laughs> <laughs> but not not graphic notation well, that's that's another whole th universe to explore for sure oh yeah absolutely yeah mm. uh, Oh, if I could brass out for a minute, I always uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, people are very interested. There's probably a few brass players out there that'll be uh, listening to this. And I'm always curious, like when, when I'm performing or j like performing what, for lack of a better word, like extended technique, um, I'm just curious to know what sort of things that you do with your, with your brass playing to sort of prepare for that. Cause sometimes we're, we're ma manipulating our, our faces and bodies and, uh, difficult ways. So I'm just curious to know what sort of things that you do to develop that, uh, develop that for yourself. Yeah, good question. Um, I also feel like I'm still like, it's just, yeah, still a really uh, um, uh, steep learning curve with that. But I, I, I guess I have enough experience now that I can kind of gauge how to, how to get through that issue. But for sure, when I was first starting to do more extended technique, I had no idea what I was doing. And I was just trying stuff. And then I would just blow out my chops immediately mm -hmm. because I oh, just having so much fun making the sound and then I, I didn't I didn't know oh actually if I do that for too long then the tissue just cannot it can't vibrate in the same way that I want it to after that or you know then you got to wait for five minutes before you do anything or so but you know over the years I've figured it out a little bit more um and i can kind of now i can kind of tell like it's kind of like just with your normal technique you kind of you can tell it's like oh I, I, i'm pushing too hard now and you know you can feel it's getting a bit tired yeah. and you're starting everything's starting to shut down and that you're getting a bit tight and ah, it's not responding the way you want and then you know what that's going to feel like if you keep pushing it's just going to not work anymore yeah. or or the next day is not going to work whatever so it's the same thing with the extended technique it's just that there's so many variables because a lot of it, um, I mean, you do develop your own, you know, techniques after a while and you get comfortable with them. So you might, you know, you might do them regularly, but I still find that when I'm, when I'm really having a great musical experience, uh, improvising, 
I'll, I'll always find something new. I mean, I don't, I don't know what just, I don't know what's happening, but it's like, this is a new sound and a new thing. And then, um, then, then, you know, you're, so then you have to learn how to, how to do that again, or how to do it so that it's manageable so that you don't, yeah, it's, 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 <laughs> yeah. It's, it's, it's fragile. It's very, it's very fragile balance for sure. And then also the way I like to play is I always want to have the, the facility to play the trumpet in a, in a, in a, what's the word? I was going to say a legit kind of way. Um, what is, there's a nicer word, <laughs> you know, a more traditional way. I just wanted to play with a nice sound and crisp and, you know, like I want to have control. Yeah. So I like to have that always at my, you know, uh, at the tip of my fingers, but at the same time, I want to be able to do the extended technique. So that is a really difficult balance to find. Absolutely. And I think it's, yeah, it's just experience, I guess. And I, I don't really practice that to figure out like, like I, uh, my mentor in Berlin, he's very organized about how he learns and develops his technique. I'm not like that. So I kind of learn the hard way. I learn while performing and then I'm like, okay, so now I have to play another set and I've got nothing, like nothing's vibrating. So oh. I guess next time I won't do that sound <laughs> for that long. Yeah. I like but that. I mean, I guess it, Oh, go ahead. Oh, I like that you were able to, you know, take a sound, but not completely discard it if it's like difficult at the start. Like finding a way to make it practical is is a very helpful tip for me. Yeah, sure. And I, I, I mean, yeah, you. Could, I guess it would make sense to practice that, but I just, I don't really practice improvising, and I find the extended technique stuff I usually just do while improvising. Mm -hmm. But yeah, well, that's not true. Actually, I have practiced some specific things that I thought like, oh, I really want to figure out how I did that. And, and sometimes you, you do need to isolate it because, you know, if you're playing some kind of multiphonics thing in, in the context of other instruments, you might not get all, get all the details. You can't hear all the details maybe. So sometimes, yeah, you do need to, that's, yeah, I do, I do actually, I have practiced <laughs> extended techniques. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and uh, do you find like when, when you are improvising, I know for myself, like there there can be sometimes like times where you fall back onto sort of a, a certain repertoire of sounds uh, mm. and, I'm, and I'm just wondering if there's like for, for you what are some of the ways that you sort of push yourself to to find those new sounds in in the moment right um yeah I mean I used to think that um, like when I first started doing the extended technique stuff I used to feel embarrassed if I did something more than once like I'd be like oh I'm doing this again and then it just felt like a gimmick or something but then I realized no it's part of my language so I, I wanted to build the language mm -hmm. so maybe this slap tongue thing with the air thing whatever maybe that's okay that's one part of the language um and that's that's cool I can use that like it's like when you're playing jazz, there's lots of things in the language that you use all the time. Yeah. Uh, so then once I got rid of that idea, it's like, oh, I, I can, it's a, it is a language and it's okay for me to actually have specific things I do. Um, so that's one thing that's probably not what you were asking, but to, to push to find new things, I just kind of, it usually is just, I'm just lost in the, in the music and there's a sound that I hear that I want, or, you know, Nick is doing something or somebody's doing something that I just, you know like a percussive thing and I'm like ah so I just you know find a way to make that sound too I just want to and then sometimes I'm just surprised like I was that me or was that him and uh so yeah I think I, I don't intentionally push to find new things it's just it's if the music wants it then I find it I guess yeah great that makes sense. I don't know. <laughs> yeah no that makes complete sense to me um, so I just want to talk a bit uh coming back to what we were started our conversation with about uh sort of traveling uh, and performing in Berlin. Uh, I know that you had mentioned that you were intending to, to set up shop there for a couple of months. Uh, I'm curious to know if that's something that you've been doing for a while and what, uh, what drew you to the city over there. I mean, I, I've been, so I've been going back and forth between Berlin and Toronto for quite a few years now. And the first time I went there was 2013. I mean, the first time I went for any length of time, I've, of course, I've been there before on tours, but um and then maybe the past uh, five years i've been going more regularly so then i just got into this routine where i would go there for three months and then come back to toronto for three months and then so keep doing that so twice a year i'd go to berlin for three months and it was really working in a lot of ways because i was able to get into the scene there uh and then I, so i'd be gone for three months when i was back in toronto but three months isn't 
too long. Mm -hmm. And it, it, I mean, for sure, it's hard to coordinate gigs because you get gig offers and then you can't do them because you're not there. But um, people wouldn't forget about me in the three month period. And then I'd, just, I'd be there again and be like, hey, you know, and you know, you're back or, or they hadn't even noticed I'd left. Um, so, uh, and, and the reason I started going there was, uh, the first reason I went was to study with uh, my mentor, Axel Derner, who's this amazing trumpet player, experimental uh, trumpet player in Berlin. And so I studied with him for a while. And um, then I just, I, right away, I met a lot of players and started doing a lot of sessions and gigging right away. It's a very open, uh, welcoming scene. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people come in and out of the scene and, uh, feel like it's a lot more open than it is here because I, I don't really know because I'm part of the scene here but I feel like people have complained before that Toronto is hard to it's hard to break in right but I feel like in Berlin you just show up and then you're in <laughs> <laughs> it's like yeah cool great um yeah and how do you find like uh just managing that I mean that's a must it must take a lot of coordination in terms of like your music business to be able to be situated in two cities uh, throughout the year. Um, so how do you find uh, just managing all of that? Yeah, I, I mean, it, it hasn't been perfect. And I keep thinking, oh, how, how am I going to keep doing this? And how, how do I, uh, how do I envision living, you know, like this for <laughs> any length of time, <laughs> but somehow it was working. It was really working until this pandemic thing, which is now it's real. I'm really like, having to, to kind of, look at it and say okay maybe it's not sustainable um but um i mean it, it it was just i would just have to make it like i i realized that i couldn't actually schedule things because i was getting gig offers in two cities mm -hmm. continuously so inevitably i could only do half the work in both cities so then i would just say like at first it was stressful to like oh i have to try to like wait and see if i can decide when this is going to be the best time to go and then I certain minds like, you know what, I'm just going to make it a regular thing. I'm in Berlin from September to the end of November. And then I'm in Toronto from December to, you know, et cetera. So yeah. then, and then whatever gigs, you know, I'd have to turn down a lot of gigs, but that's just life. Yeah, like, exactly. I'm sorry, I'm not going to be there or I'm going to be in Toronto at that point. So yeah, there was a lot of heart, heartbreaking kind of turning down of things, but that just kind of goes with the territory. So then I thought, okay, maybe I should just, moved there to Berlin but then I never quite got got that happening I wasn't able to I didn't want to let go of Toronto because it's so much important so many important people here and for you know my bands and yeah I got complicated <laughs> <laughs> uh, so uh, we're almost out of time here but uh, I just want to uh, touch on your uh, record label uh, Luma Records I know you've just released uh, several new records. Um, so I'm just wondering if you could talk about uh, your record company uh, and what, what's that all about? <laughs> <laughs> That's nice. I like hearing you say that, record company. <laughs> or record label. Uh, yeah. yeah, well, I mean, uh, it's nice. I mean, um, it's just, you know, it's just me. <laughs> yeah. So um, uh, let's see, what can I say about it? I, I mean, um, I started it quite a long time ago and I, I, at the time I wasn't really serious about it. I just was like, I just want to have control over the situation and I don't want to deal with having to like beg and plead people to listen to something, put it on their label or whatever. And I, yeah, I just, I guess I just wanted to have control over, you know, over the music and over the, how, who's, you know, who's going to make more effort than me to get it out there really mm -hmm. is what I realized in the end. And I don't have money to pay someone to, to do it on my behalf. So um, that's why I started it. And then, um, yeah, over the years, I just kept doing it. And now I feel like it, you know, it takes years of perseverance, but, um, and hard work, but now I feel like I got somewhere with it, maybe. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I'm, Go ahead. <laughs> oh, and I just want, and it seems like, you know, with the having the ability to release your own records on your own terms, uh, and you've released uh, already this year two two new records? Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. So it seems like that seems like a really positive uh, way to go about doing it. Um, but if you if you could just talk about those new records I released, I know you released a new uh, solo record mm -hmm. with your group in Berlin. Yeah, that's right. Um, yeah, so I... Um... What can I tell you about that? Um, 
I'm well, very curious like to know to with, know. The, with, the, with the solo <laughs> record, I'm just wondering about the sort of your approach to that uh, and what goes into making a solo record. Right. Uh, yeah, that was that was a tough process for me. And I mean, it was a very personal um, process. Um, uh, let's see. So uh, my friend Justin Haynes died. Um, uh, and then uh, that was last year. And so after that, because um, I was we were planning to do another duo recording together. So after he died, I was also completely shocked and I like, just devastated. So I, I just thought, okay, I'm going to make, I'm going to make this whole record. And uh, it just as a way to kind of keep myself focused on something productive. And mm -hmm. uh, also at the time I was just so in just sort of the state of shock and, and having so much grief that I, the only thing I could do was write music. Um, so I just sat at the piano writing music, writing music and playing on, on the trumpet. And so I had a bunch of ideas that I developed as a solo thing. And I, yeah, anyway, so that was, it was kind of a, I, I didn't, yeah, it didn't really, I didn't have an idea of how it was going to go until it, I just started doing it. And then uh, even when I was in the rec recording process, uh, I had ideas. I thought, oh, this is going to, this is what it's going to be like. So I, you know, I'd written a composition and I came to the studio and I played it and then I was like, that's not, that's not good enough or that's not what I wanted or I, I hadn't figured out um, that I wanted. So in the, in the end, I feel like each piece is its own kind of sound story or its own kind of, uh, uh, I don't know how to put it, but um, yeah, it's, it's a very, each piece is very distinctive. So I think if you only listen to one piece, you wouldn't get the idea of the whole record. Um, but that's not how I went into it. When I went into it, I thought, I got to sh show everything I can do in every piece. Yeah. And then it just, it was just like, no, actually, no, that's not, that's not interesting for me. Uh, and also I had all this melodic material that I wanted to convey. So again, it was an organic process. Yeah. Uh, I think that's, I feel like that's the, the lesson of the day is uh, trusting, <laughs> yeah, trusting yeah, the I mean, process. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I mean, yeah, just being patient and being open to like, the, to being open to the process, I guess. And sometimes you don't know what, what's going to happen. And that's the exciting part is that things will happen if you're open to it, I guess. Mm -hmm. Great. Uh, so just one last question before we wrap up here. Just curious to know, uh, you know, we're here in Halifax. This is part of the Halifax Jazz Festival. I'm just curious to know about your... Uh, experiences playing in Halifax like wh when was the last time that you were here oh too long ago really I can't even remember what year um I've been there quite a few times with the quartet with Lena Alamano four um we played at the festival also we played uh in the off season um hmm I don't remember the last time and and we did some uh yeah we did up, upstream that wasn't my group um oh with clutter tones Oh yeah, clutter tones. That's right. Yeah, yeah. yeah. open water. So. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I love Halifax so much. It's such a great, great town, and yeah, a great scene too. It's, I mean, it's small, but it's it's a good scene. Yeah, I th I really think that Halifax, in terms of contemporary improvising music, it really uh, the amount of it really exceeds the the population. There's so many fantastic players. Totally. Uh, yeah. Great. Well, hopefully we can get you out uh, out here again sometime <laughs> in the future. I hope so. <laughs> If you could just give uh, give a rundown of where people can find you online, which is uh, okay. the, the, the way these days. Um, oh, yeah. And if people want to find your music, uh, where whereabouts so you can find all that? Uh, I, I guess my website's pretty clear. So people could go to that and, and find my record label from there and also all my projects and music. So I think that's probably the best thing to do. And that's just my name spelled out, Lena Alamano. So you have to know how to spell it, I guess. But... <laughs> We'll, dro I we'll could... drop it in the comments. Okay, yeah. nice. Um, that's that's probably the best place to start. Great. All right. Well, thanks. Uh, thanks so much for taking the time to have a conversation here. I also uh, like to appreciate and point out that I like the the differences in our backgrounds. You've got a very minimal minimalist background. I've got this. Uh, sort of oh yeah, 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 totally. <laughs> oh yeah, that's nice. <laughs> <laughs> that's nice. Yeah. yeah. Cool. Great. Well, thanks so much, and uh, hopefully you stay safe, and then that uh, things uh, yeah, things in too. the art world will keep on track. Yeah, on. let's let's keep our fingers crossed. Yeah. Yeah. Great. Okay, Excellent. well, thanks so much. All right, thanks a lot. Okay. okay. See you. <laughs> Music brings us together, even when we're apart. That's why we support Canadian musicians, festivals, and award shows. 
It's just one of the ways TD's Ready Commitment helps build a more inclusive tomorrow.